That's all right. We're, we're still uh, alive. I want you to look with me over to Acts uh, tonight, uh, chapter 4. Acts 4, and Preacher Charles, thank you for letting us be here and appreciate all of you. Uh, we've been over, I guess the pastor told you, we've been in Winston-Salem with our, our wife today over at the hospital. And she's going through quite a few medical things the last couple of years, but Lord knows all about that. And uh, they uh, kind of wasn't on time either. <laughs> Can't understand. They tell you to be there at 1 o'clock. They don't even register to about 2. <laughs> but it's okay. Acts chapter 4. Interesting story here in the word of Almighty God. And I know you've come tonight to pray and to believe God and to seek His face. I need not educate any of us tonight over the temporal situations and circumstances that are existing in our dear country. I don't think any of us here in God's house tonight could have imagined uh, just a mere five years ago or ten years ago especially what would be uh, situationally uh, becoming uh, established in our country as, as what is accepted. You study uh, the prophecy of Isaiah from Isaiah 1 to Isaiah 6 and you suddenly see an incredible, uh, just a, an amazing parallel of that day and this day. Calling that which is evil good, that which is good evil, and on and on we could go. But you come to the sixth chapter and God said, Who will I send and who will go for us? And old Isaiah said in the year Uzziah, you, uh, King Uriah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And those seraphims with six wings, two wings they hid their face, two wings they hid their feet, and with two wings they did fly. And they were ping-ponging praise to God in the house of God. And the glory of God vibrated and quaked and even moved the big doors there in the house of God. Wouldn't you like to see Shekinah glory move in God's house across America? My goodness. And uh, saw the Lord high and lifted up. God is God. Psalms 90, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. I know the world and the unregenerate mind could never possibly comprehend the person of our God. He was never born, and he'll never die. He's not finite as we. He is infinite. He is God. Always has been, always will be. And we are convinced as his children tonight that he became a person and his son. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And now the very essence of God is the Holy Spirit. And if you've been redeemed, regenerated and reborn, the Holy Spirit has made your heart his residency. And then Jesus said a very amazing, blessed thing. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. <laughs> I'll help you, I'll strengthen you, and I'll uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Don't you be afraid. Then and that's in 41 and 43, when you pass through the waters, and we will. Most concise, precise definition of human existence. Job 14, 1, man born of a woman. You got a mama in here tonight? Then you got a few days and full of trouble. <laughs> but God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. But when you pass through those waters, I will be with you. They will not overflow you. And when you inevitably walk through the fire, the fire and the flame will not kindle up against you. For I will hold your hand saying, Fear not, for I am with thee. Amen. Now get this, 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How many times did they try to obviate from the planet God's people in the Old Testament? Countless times. And yet, God always intervened. 
even when his people became wicked, rebellious, and were turned into captivity and servitude, God still blessed them. Daniel did not bow to Nebuchadnezzar's God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the plains of Dura. When the band played, they didn't dance. When he set out the buffet, they didn't dine. <laughs> they said, what is this? We can't eat this meat and we can't drink this wine. So they didn't bow. They didn't bend. And you know they didn't burn. We don't dance to the bands of this world. We don't dine on their buffet. And we sure not going to be delusioned by their brainwashing. Some of these folks will believe these lies, but not the regenerated people of God. For the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us into all truth. And he is the great lie detector. If you're a child of God and you have the Holy Spirit within you, you can pretty much very quickly pick up on a lie. And so when they got out there on the plains of Dura, the great command was when you hear the music, everybody bow to this great image to Nebuchadnezzar. And you can't fault old Nebuchadnezzar. Why? In his natural mind, he naturally presumed that had him and his army been able to conquer all the other nations, then it was obvious to him. Their deities were far less in power and intellect than his deities. But he looked around one day and all of his advisors said, we don't really have, you know, we got all these different little deities, but we need a big God. Why don't you be God? <laughs> there you go. Make me a golden image, 120 foot high. Set it on the plains of Dura. I'll have a VIP celebration and we'll dedicate it and make all of our leaders bow down and we'll intimidate them and we'll just, uh, just see. Well, out there and among that bunch, they had those three Hebrew boys. Amen. How well do you know that story? Everybody bowed but them. So here we are in 2014 at Charity Baptist Church in Bluntville, Tennessee. I don't know about you, but by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, they can play all the music they want to play, but we're not going to dance. <laughs> they can put out all the buffet they want, but we ain't going to dine. And they can put out all the gods they want to, but we only have one true and living God, and we know who he is. <laughs> And just as he is one with the Father, now we are one with him. Therefore, we are one with the Father. We still got victory, irregardless of the surroundings or the situational circumstances. Now, it's easy to stand in a revival meeting like this. But out there at the job place or in the neighborhood or in your family functions, when you've got those who have been brainwashed, and you got those who are bowing to the little gods of this world, they may question you. But I hope you will answer the inquisition that I have victory in the Lord. And by the grace of God that saved me, by that same grace I will stand. By that same grace I will be steadfast. By that same grace I will be unmovable. And I'll always abound in the work of the Lord, for as much as we all know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Somebody naturally told Nebuchadnezzar, you got those three boys over there from Jerusalem that you've been so good to, and they're not returning the favor too favorably. They're defying you. Boys, do y'all understand? I said when you hear the music, bow down. What do y'all not understand about that directive? <laughs> well, we don't misunderstand much about it, King. You, you told us about it. Well, why didn't you bow? We can't. That monstrosity there <laughs> is not our God. <laughs> There's only one true and living God, and he's not changed. Boys, I whipped him. 
Really? Do y'all not understand that we burned his house to the ground? Do you don't understand that we butchered his people? He didn't lift a finger to defy me or to defend his own. Who is that God that's going to deliver you out of my hand? We're not careful to answer thee in this matter, O king. <laughs> in other words, no problem. The God we serve is able. <laughs> And he will deliver us out of your hand. Now that got a little fury raising up in the king. You don't talk back to me. Especially so unthankful that everything I've done for you, now you're embarrassing me here in front of all the rest of the VIPs here. Boys, y'all better be careful. But I tell you what I'm going to do. Though you've got a little rage raising up in me right now, I'm going to give you another chance. We're going to hit this music again in a minute, and you boys had better bow down. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> so they gagged their mouths, bound them up, and with pomp and circumstance, walked them up the catwalk, up the ramp, and into the fiery furnace, slamming the door behind them and going on with the festivities of the dedication of their deity. Not much doubt in my mind, some little aide or assistant or whoever it was, come up with an idea for a finale for all the festivities. Why don't we just put a little fear in everyone else here and show them what becomes of the enemies of the state and those that would defy Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar, our God. What do you got in mind, boys? Play some dramatic music. Let's slowly open the doors and reveal three little black charred human remains smoldering in the fire as the fire cools. Splendid idea. Though it's not on the agenda, we can add it last minute. And they did it, <laughs> but wasn't they about to be surprised? <laughs> hey, Nebuchadnezzar, yes. the God that you searched for and the God that you defied and the God that you were making fun of wasn't afraid of you. He just had a problem with the rebellion and the sin of his own people. It wasn't about you and him. It was about him and his people. And what a lesson we can learn there. We will never lose the presence of our God. But we can sure see a diminishing of his power in our lives. For he maintains his righteousness and he forever perpetuates his holiness. And he cannot look upon sin, nor will he bless pride or anything that looks like it. So the world doesn't understand God, but we ought to. And I think those three boys had a grasp on that. God is long-suffering. God is merciful. And the only way in the world that any of us here in God's house tonight can ever be pursuing and advancing the great doctrine of sanctification in our lives is by knowing the Word of God by reading it, by studying it, by applying it to our lives, knowing that the grace of God that brings salvation in Titus 2.11 hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And the very thing that is more antagonistic to our God than anything else is pride. Those boys knew the word, though. There was a prophet preaching in Jerusalem with tears, turn back. In the 16th verse of the 6th chapter, that great prophecy that bears his name, he would say, pleading, as for the old paths wherein is the good way, and walk therein, but the people said, we will not walk therein. Even with false preachers like Hananiah, that told Zedekiah, 
We've got this thing figured out. We can't insult you. We can't go against the political correctness of today. Why, King, don't listen to that old preacher, Jeremiah. He's telling you you won't be blessed, but I'm telling you you will be. He's telling you you'd better walk those old paths, but we don't do that anymore. While we know that traditional marriage shouldn't just be between a man and a woman, we know that adultery shouldn't be mentioned anymore, that people want to live together without being married. Well, what's wrong with that, said the guy. We've got different ways and new ways now. Don't you listen to Jeremiah. You can have the false word of the world or you can have the truth of the word of Almighty God. And so finally God said to Jeremiah, you might as well quit your preaching. They're not going to listen to it. And for 70 years, there will be a captivity. But after seven decades... He said it in the 32nd chapter. Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in the land. You get this lesson tonight, brothers and sisters. We might indeed go through some hard times in this world, but God will see us through. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 7, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And those three young Hebrew boys knew their faith was grounded not in the way they felt, not in where they were, but solely upon the truth of God's unchanging Word. That Psalms 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You can't add anything to it. You cannot take anything away from it. Houses and fields and vineyards will be possessed again in the land. You remember that story over there where old Jeremiah was shut up in the prison. They didn't like him. <laughs> so they're not going to like us either. Our Lord Jesus told us, don't be surprised when the world doesn't think much of you. But are we in a popularity contest? No. Are we called to be loved of this world? No. Are we called to be pacifist and to try to pacify this world like we're hearing from so many nationwide, big-time so-called preachers? Goodness alive. We are by our spiritual nature antagonistic to this world. We have nothing in common with this world. We've been regenerated from this world, called out from this world, but then commissioned and ordained by God to go right back in the middle of this world, not to be like them, but to tell them all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We go with the message of mercy. We go bearing the light of God's love. We go offering the, the great uh, the offering of God for life and salvation to whosoever will. Let him come and take of the water of life freely. So situational circumstances, political whims will always change. But those boys knew the word. And so Jeremiah was shut up in prison by the political powers of his day. And then here came one of his cousins. The dude was named Hanemiel from Anathoth. And you remember, we won't go into it, but the law of redemption in the Old Testament. That boy had the right to of redeem, or he knew that Jeremiah had the right to redeem a piece of property he had, and he was selling out. Listen, don't you sell out. What God has given you, you hold fast your profession. I don't care what political correctness says. I don't care what your kids say or think. I don't care whatever it is. If you are a child of God, Hebrew said to hold fast your profession and don't be duped by the lies of the devil, but you just hold on to that truth. So Hanamiel was selling out. He said, hey, Jeremiah, you've got to write a redemption, that piece of property down yonder. Why don't you buy it? Old Jeremiah said, what do you have for it? He said, well, 17 shekels of silver sounds good. You know God will bless you in the midst of anything. He might have been a jailbird, but he reached in his robe pocket and he pulled out 17 shekels of pure silver. <laughs> I'm telling you, my God, Philippians 4, 19, shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Somebody got to scratch in their head. He, you know, he knew the personal clerk of the court, Barak. Barak, what a name. <laughs> He 
And the clerk of the court went from the courthouse over to the jailhouse and said, how can I help you, Jeremiah? He said, bring the secretary. I want you to fix me up a deed. So they give him the, Jeremiah put the money down. Barak got the deed already and sealed it. And then obviously somebody in all those proceedings said, Jeremiah, you've been preaching around here that the Babylonians are going to come in here, take over everything. And all of our lands and properties and holdings and financial uh, holdings and everything will be gone. What are you doing? When they finally get the deed and the clerk gave it to Jeremiah, he handed it back. And he said, you got any good earthen vessels around here? Put my deed in an earthen vessel that it'll continue many days because houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in the land. <laughs> God said to Jeremiah in a private conference, is there anything too hard for me? Doubtless later on that night, the old devil got to playing games in Jeremiah's mind and said, boy, didn't you put on a show? Then you stick your neck out. You know good and well it's over. And you made a fool out of yourself. But in the midst of the devil's taunts, God came back with truth and told Jeremiah, not in question form, but with an exclamation point. He said, my son, there's nothing too hard for me. Can God revive America? You better believe it. Can God restore America? Yes. Can God save your loved ones? Yes. Can God get a hold of their hearts? Yes. Can God, there's nothing too hard for God. Mark chapter 11 verse 24 says, Jesus said when you pray and you ask for something, you believe that you've got it. Romans chapter 4, oh Abraham called that which was not as if it is. So now the greatest fear that Jeremiah ever had all of those tears were justified when the prison doors were busted open by the Babylonian assault forces. And Jeremiah walked up those steps out of that prison and he saw the black smoke billowing all over Jerusalem. And from there on Moriah, yonder toward Moriah, the black smoke bellered heavenward. And Jeremiah entered the temple grounds and they were burning and everything was being destroyed. The holy vessels, listen carefully, of worship and adoration were being carted away on Babylonian wagons headed to Babylonian warehouses way over yonder in Babylon. Have we let the enemy take the precious treasure of prayer, the precious treasure of love, the precious treasure of mercy, the precious treasure of peace, the precious treasure of purpose, the precious treasure of unity and camaraderie and forbearance, and most of all, the power of God's grace and the glory of God's presence. Have we allowed the enemies to come into the God's house in 2014 and load their wagons with our treasures and head on out to Babylon. You, they had the table of showbread. They had the golden candelabra. They had the brazen altar. They had the golden altar. They had everything but one little precious thing. The Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. That was a representation in an Old Testament typology of none other than the full power and priesthood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The devil might waller me, but he can't touch my God. The devil might monkey with all of God's people, but he can't monkey with our God. And I'm telling you, when we recognize our problem is, we get ignorant. We revert back to an old carnal mind and we don't even know the things of God in His Word. We can't get fully engaged in His work because Romans 8, 6 says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And now Jeremiah sees all of his worst fears coming to fruition. And in that crowd of, of captives headed back, to Babylon were those four Hebrew boys that are so popular. Neck irons and chains. And now those three standing on the plains of Bura 
And old Nebuchadnezzar saying, Who is that God? I looked for him and couldn't find him. You was looking in the wrong places. And you don't know him, King. But the God we serve is able and he will deliver us. But let us say one other thing, King. If he doesn't deliver us today and we die in that furnace, they looked right at him. A little silence built up the drama. All the other participants with great expectation cupped their hands behind their ears to hear what those young men would say when they said, even if we die today, are they going to say they're going to recant? Are they going to give in? Are they going to repent? Are they going to ask His forgiveness? (laughs) If we die today, we still aren't going to (laughs) bow. That's confidence in God, ain't it? So up the ramp they went, bound, and they got pitched in the fire. But may I say here at Charity Baptist Church tonight, He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. For before the big iron doors slammed shut and the lock was placed in place, inside that fire there was a cool breeze. The ropes immediately disintegrated in the heat. (laughs) And the fourth man, I believe with all my soul, Michael, the captain of the war forces of New Jerusalem, said to God, aren't you proud of those boys talking faith? And God said, I sure am. Because without faith, I can't be pleased. But faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Michael said, just let me and a couple angels go down there. We'll slap that crowd around and we'll release those three boys. And yet... The Yahweh of Israel, Jehovah himself, stood up in the presence of of the very, uh, right in the very center of heaven and said, listen, I believe I'll take care of this mission myself. I'm going to go right down there in that fire and before they ever get there, I'm going to be there. Let me tell you tonight, before you ever get to tomorrow, he's right there waiting with outstretched arms. He's in your heart. That means wherever you go, he is. Praise God. If you get sick, go to the hospital. That's bad. Nothing to praise. I'm not praising God for that, but I'm praising God if any of us end up in an ICU tonight with a major stroke to where we can't even talk to your wife or your children and you can't even communicate with another earthly loved one, you can talk to the fourth man. He'll be right there in the fire with you. Man, I'm glad we got victory tonight. All the time, all the way. So they opened up the door to close the festivities, thinking they would intimidate everybody. But old Nebuchadnezzar was looking out over their faces, I assume, just to see the dread and the awe. And just to, just, it was just a ruthless thing to do, but they did that more back then than even we do now. It was just a fear tactic of intimidation to try to conquest and control the people and especially his upper epsilon of government. The boy was he surprised when he saw the responses. They weren't overwhelmed with fear. You could, you could see the plain astonishment in their faces. Their eyes got big. Their eyelids lifted. They were taken back. And they got to pointing. But it was obvious to the king they weren't having upset stomach or getting nauseated because they saw three charred human remains. Obviously something far different. So curiosity naturally won out in old Nebuchadnezzar's mind and he whirled to see. And when he whirled to see, he saw something. (laughs) He turned around and asked the most crazy question. He said, did not we throw three men in there? <laughs> Everybody's head was bopping up affirming. <laughs> three men bound. 
sure as you're born, king, we put three men in there, and all three of them were bound. He said, well, how in the world I see four loose walking in the midst of that fire and look at that fourth man. You want to have a move of God in your life? Take another look at that fourth man and know the same fourth man that was walking with, with, Meshach, with Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego is right inside your life as a believer. And if he could deliver them and be with them through their situational circumstances, dire as it was, do you think he's not with you? And if he got them through that, do you not think that he can get you through that which you're going through tonight? And what's the purpose of it all? To glorify him. Nebuchadnezzar got his secretaries and all, and he said, I want you to put this in the Babylonian code and record and in every historical record that we've got in this entire empire. I want you to put down that there's no God like the God of the Hebrews. <laughs> Although I looked for him all around Jerusalem and I thought he was puny and frightened, he's done showed up at my big party right here in Babylon. He's not puny, he's mighty. He's not afraid, he's bold. He is the God of the universe. Boy, can we not bring glory to our God. Everything in the world that happens to us may not have been authored by him. It might have been authored by the devil. It might have been authored by sin. It might have been authored by negative circumstance. But whatsoever the situation is, God is in that situation. And he's able to take that situation and in his time, He'll turn it all around for his glory. Just like young Joseph told his brothers in the 50th chapter of Genesis, I'm not stupid. I know y'all meant every bit of it for evil, but God meant it for good. Not just to deliver me, but deliver us all. So I will glory in my infirmity, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That young man was scared to death out there in that abandoned pit in that desert, but he knew God was with him. And somehow or another, the, 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 the grace of God could turn that thing around and God would, would take any negative situation if I will give him my care, 1 Peter chapter 5, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Every negative heart-wrenching situation, you can lay that down in the compassionate, powerful, loving care and ministry of Jesus. And if you know the Greek word for the heat, the English word healing, it comes from, it means therapy. It might not necessarily, I might not necessarily be totally physically healed. But my healer, Jehovah Rapha, Psalms 103, I've healed all your diseases. I've forgiven all your iniquities. It's done and done. And he cares. It's like a good loving nurse. You might be sick and feel bad in the hospital, but she comes in, put a cold rag on your head, kisses your cheek, and just says, Honey, I'm so sorry. You feel better. <laughs> That's her care. That's her ministry. Your wife just sort of squeezes your hand and says, it'll be all right after a while. Just some exhortation and care from the Lord. And he does care for you. And he may, in Ecclesiastes 3, he makes all things beautiful in his time. So we've got an ordeal here in America now, don't we? Now let's quickly look at Acts 4. Some of you are thinking, I believe he forgot. Real quickly, chapter 3, the lame man been healed. We don't have to give a big scripture lesson on this tonight. You know it as good as I do. You've heard this preached, taught, you've read it many times. The lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple was lame and everybody knew it. And even Jesus had passed him several times, but it wasn't quite time yet because he had something better in mind. You grab onto that little nugget and put it in your mind. If you ain't got what God's got planned yet, you will. You believe God by faith. So now Peter and John goes up, and this old boy is saved. Repent and be converted, verse 19 of chapter 3. You know, you wrote right beside chapter 2, verse 38. You ought to write down chapter 3, verse 19, but we'll keep on motivating there. The word's converted in verse 19 of chapter 3. And this boy not only walks, but he runs and he leaps and 
5,000 people was saved. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? The number of the men was 5,000, verse 4 of chapter 4. Now the rulers and the elders, Annas and Caiaphas, all of those that had presided over the kangaroo court that sentenced Jesus to die guilty of blasphemy. And they saw this man, they saw all those people turning to Christ. And they asked a question in verse 7, by what power or by what name have you done this? Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Says in verse 10, this man's walking and running and leaping by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. See that in verse 10? We still have the power in that name operational and functional in our lives and in our midst tonight. Whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now they've got this big meeting going on. Verse 12 is the famous verse. I think we could all quote, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's power in the name of our Jesus. So church, before we leave here tonight, just reaffirm in your mind that you're not going to be intimidated by this world. You're not going to march to the drumbeat of this world. Your pastor, the leadership, the membership of this church, may it be known all over Bluntville, Tennessee, that Charity Baptist Church is one with Christ. And we're not ashamed to identify with him. And we don't have to march to the drumbeat of this world because we're not going to. We're in it, but we're not of it. But we've been called to go into it with this message of mercy, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the lame can still run, and the blind can still see, and the deaf can still hear, and the dead can can still be raised. All of that is indicative of sinners being saved. And then you and I as Christians, we should allow our lives, as Paul told them in Corinth, to be credible living epistles of the gospel of Christ. For how true it is, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one walk with me than merely show me the way. What my life says is so loud that people are not going to pay much attention to my lips without that being reinforced credibly with my life. And now Peter, not afraid anymore, but bold. Not running and hiding anymore, but standing. Because on resurrection evening, the wounded hands of Christ took his face and bent old Peter's face back a little bit. And John 21, Jesus breathed and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. My, he breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam was made a living soul. But when the second Adam breathed into his church, We became his body on this earth, his building, his bride, a royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2, a chosen generation, a holy nation, the church of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if you've been saved, you're a member of that church. And if you haven't been saved, boy, and I, we, we all have, well, not just me, we all have great news for you tonight. Obviously, someone invited you to revival, probably your family or a friend. Now I'm going to tell you something. Best thing you could ever do, trust me on this, if you're not a Christian, is walk down these aisles tonight to receive the Savior who struggled up the hill of Calvary with your sin, died in your place, descended into the bowels of death, hell, and the grave with your guilty sentence. And yet, descending with your condemnation, he arose with your justification and ascended all the way to heaven with your salvation. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
No wonder he cried to let's die on that cross. Done, it's finished. Everything that was promised came to fruition in and of and by and for the Lord Jesus Christ. As he said to Thomas in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he stands here tonight with outstretched arms and blood dripping hands saying to you, come unto me. <laughs> now will you please do that tonight? Don't let the devil tell you. Well, what are you going to do tomorrow? You tell the devil, I'm not worried about that because the same Savior that I trust tonight will be my Lord and friend tomorrow. <laughs> so don't put your trust in you. Put your trust in him. Don't put your trust in Brother Charles, Brother Mike, or any other preacher here tonight. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we all be bold. And may we all allow God to give us confidence and courage just like Peter and John and their meeting in this council. And this council now is threatening them. Look at it. Now he said, let me tell you something, boys. We're not going to have this. <laughs> Verse 13, when they saw their boldness, the, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. May this world all around Tennessee and Virginia know one thing, that we've been with Jesus. And behold, in the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. Here they get privately. Now they're behind closed doors, and let's get a little glimpse of what they said here in verse 16. What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we can't deny it. <laughs> deny it, world. I was dead, now I'm alive. You can't do nothing to that. Praise God, you get these old dope heads out here and they come into church and now I'm better have a transplant. Some of y'all used to frequent the bar rooms of Sullivan County, Tennessee, but you don't anymore. Why? You're a notable miracle. <laughs> You've been with Jesus. Now you're in him. He's in you. And you're living for his glory and the glory of his grace. This bunch might not have liked it, but they couldn't do much about it. They said, this lame man's right here with, what are we going to do? But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly, watch this in verse 17, threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Read, read that in verse 17 to your heart right there where you say it. Brother Charles, I don't know. This Supreme Court, I didn't hear much about it. I heard just a little bit of radio news today, but I reckon I know our state senators and state delegates up in Virginia have been waiting for this Supreme Court deal. And I understand if I heard it right, just a piece of it, you all probably know more about it than I do. I reckon the Supreme Court refused to hear the state challenges of the reversal of the, the federal courts in the Defense of Marriage Act. So I don't, it doesn't affect Tennessee, but it does me in Virginia. Activists won't go to a florist that uh, would gladly flower up the wedding of same-sex couples. No, they'll go to a florist that they know is a Christian. They won't go to a baker that'll gladly serve anybody and everybody. They'll go to a Christian baker. They won't go to some liberal humanist preacher in Sullivan County and ask them to perform their ceremony, they'll come to Brother Charles. And naturally, he'll say, can't do that. Now, in my situation, Brother Gary, up in, in Virginia, when the law of the Commonwealth says they can, see, I'm authorized by the state of Virginia. I'm not really sure about I've married a couple of couples in Tennessee and with the paperwork, I'm not really sure. So you all know a lot more about that than I do. But I know in Virginia... We are authorized by the commonwealth to perform marriages. So if I don't succumb to the law of the commonwealth, then they'll take my authorization to marry anybody. We're being threatened. That's all I'm saying. But there's nothing new under heaven. God's people have faced such for 2,000 years and we're still here. 
And let me tell you something emphatically and dogmatically and unapologetically tonight. If the Lord doesn't come for the next 2,000 years, there will still be the Lord's church operational and active because the gates of hell is not going to prevail against it. And when you hear people say the church is being delegated down to irrelevancy, you say that's a lie of your father the devil. The church is here and the church ain't going nowhere but two directions. We're either going forward or we're going upward. And there ain't no other direction direction for God's church. You believe that? Say amen. amen. Thank God we've got victory. We don't have the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. They threatened them. Y'all quit using that name. The world's not afraid of the name of Mohammed. The world's not afraid of the name of Buddha. The, name, the world's not afraid of the name Hare Krishna or any other Indian uh, religion or Far Eastern mystical religion. But when it comes to that name that is above every name, the demons and devils tremble. Satan knows he has to bow down. For his head was severely bruised unto death 2,000 years ago. And let me tell you something, Mr. Devil. I know it's just a matter of time for you, big boy, till my Lord baptizes you in the black water of the lake of everlasting fire. And we'll rejoice when you go in. Yeah. Are you with me? <laughs> so you can resist him and you can rebuke him. Don't lay down and let him have his way, church. Let us be unified in this great thing that we are notable miracles by the grace of Almighty God. Now, Peter and John, they just said, boys, whether you, we're going to listen to you or God, you judge. But we're just going to do what God tells us to do because we can't do nothing but speak the things which we've seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Wouldn't you like to see the community glorifying the grace of God? Then why don't we just get on our knees tonight and say, Lord... Here's the hardest thing, Pastor. The Laodicea church in Revelation 3, the Lord said to them, Repent. For you say you're rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. And you don't even realize that you're poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked. But I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire that you may be rich. I salve that you may see and white raiment that the shame of your nakedness or other words, the manifestation of the, of the inner character of the first Adam would be manifested in your conduct such as Galatians 5, wrath, sedition, envying, strife, not getting along, not loving one another and all these things. But Jesus said if you'll repent, you can have this gold and I'll anoint your eyes and you can be dressed again with my righteousness that people cannot see you and your inevitable flaws, but they can see me and my faithfulness and my compassion towards you and my long-suffering with you. Just glorify me in your life and even in your body like Romans 12 teaches us to do. So tonight, amidst the threatening and amidst a political correct country, and amidst of a nation to where I think it's deliberately being attempted to bring it down. We've got this crazy influenza out of Guatemala and Honduras now that the press even even talking about hitting our schools. You've got people with not Christian agendas and objectives for America. And I look around and I see these beautiful children here in God's house on this Monday night. And I remember how that I was raised back in the 60s and early 70s in doubtless the greatest nation that's ever been on the face of God's globe. Where you could get a job about anywhere you wanted to. You could drop out of high school, get a good paying job, buy a new car, buy a home, put your kids through college. Buy a little piece of ground for $1,000. Can't do that now. 
Get all the brushes, briars, and brambles off of it, flip it for about three, make you $2,000 profit in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Buy and sell, wheel and deal. And somebody without even a high school diploma can retire with six or seven hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Try to do that now. And when I grew up in America, most of our mamas were at home. Dad's just worked in one of the local factories, but we always had a pretty good car, a new car most times. Paid the mortgage, achieved the American dream. I hate to tell you, I'm a grandpa too. But my little grandchildren, they don't have that opportunity. They're going to have to really dig. Well, need a college education. You checked with most of your colleges now. You better have a minimum of a hundred grand. What in the world happened to old America? The psalmist said, "All nations that forget God." But our God is still God, and He has a plan. And in the most stressful, demanding circumstances is when he really excels at using his people. Because we all know the darker the night, the brighter the light. And the colder the chill, the more attractive that fire is over yonder. <laughs> So let's build the fire up so that the light can shine bright. Set out the bread. Set out the grape juice. Let the waters flow. And those that are called will come to the fountain. We're not celebrating defeat here tonight. We're just pointing out an opportunity. And when opportunities are seized by God's people, Simply being obedient to him, he will send omnipotence from him. And the power of the Holy Spirit and the glory of God's grace will begin to work, even in the most trying times. Do we want to go further? No. Jeremiah begged the people, turn around now. We've got an opportunity in America these next few months, and I hope we'll pray. I hope if you're not registered to vote, you'll get registered. I heard now, boy, this is a revival preacher. You shouldn't say that. But again, when I found out the other day from some of these, uh, you know, folks that are supposed to be knowing what they're talking about, 11 million Christians don't even care to vote. Did you hear what I said? 11 million of us in America aren't even voting. When you used to hold revivals when you were much younger, and I was a kid strumming a guitar at some of your revivals. Now, you didn't say, I don't ever remember you saying this. But see, you weren't the only one we'd go hear. <laughs> but you was probably one of the few that we'd go back when we wouldn't even sing into here again. But some of those old preachers, when I was a kid, I believe they meant well, but I can vividly remember them saying that we as God's people shouldn't be involved in politics, shouldn't be involved out here in the world. So maybe... That sort of bled over, and there's 11 million of us now just letting other people decide the direction of the United States of America. We're not called to go out and, you know, debate and challenge and be mean-spirited or anything like that. But for heaven's sake, don't just let it go without praying and getting engaged in the process that I personally believe God has blessed us with as American citizens, we're citizens too, and we've got a voice. So let us use that voice. You say, what's the title of this message tonight? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> but we've took into the word of the Lord, and it's this book that, that sanctifies us. And Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. 
So there's not anyone who's lost in here tonight and only you and God can judge you. But you don't have to exit these doors lost. You can make your way to Christ. And all of us tonight, even in the midst of the threatenings, that'd be a good title, wouldn't it? Triumph in the midst of threatenings. That's good, ain't it? That comes from the Lord, didn't it? Don't be intimidated. Because 2 Timothy 1.7, God hadn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, 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 love and a sound mind. Heavenly Father, would you take your word tonight